Sara Paretsky, and others. Crime Story Collection At the Old Swimming Hole by Sara Paretsky I was sitting on a wooden seat at the University of Illinois indoor swimming pool, and I was not enjoying myself. The air was hot and wet, the seats were hard, and the noise was terrible. Shouts from the swimmers, the officials, and the public were making my head ache. I had come to watch a swimming competition organized by Chicago businesses to collect money for sick people. A number of companies had sent teams. My old school friend, Alicia Dauphin, was in the Berman Airplanes team, and she had asked me to come and watch her swim. I came because she was an old friend, though we didn't often meet now, as we had different interests. At school Alicia was interested in only two things, swimming and engines. She studied engineering at university, and then she joined Berman Airplanes Company and worked on the design of planes. And me? I'm a private detective. My business is crime. Six competitors were standing at the end of the pool, ready to start the women's event. From where I sat, it wasn't easy to recognize Alicia. I knew she was wearing a red swimsuit, but there were three swimmers in red. The pool was divided into seven lanes. My program said that Alicia was in lane two. The woman in the first lane was complaining about something. The organizer changed the swimmers' positions, leaving the first lane empty. Now one red suit was in lane two, one in lane three, and one in lane six. I didn't know which one was Alicia. The starting gun was fired, and six bodies threw themselves into the water. There was a perfect start in lane six. That must be Alicia. The woman in lane two seemed to be having problems. What was wrong? The water around her was turning red. I pushed through the crowd to the side of the pool, kicked off my shoes, and jumped in. I swam under the water to the second lane and pulled the woman to the edge where someone lifted her out. No, it wasn't Alicia. I shouted to an official to telephone for an ambulance and knelt down beside the woman. The blood seemed to be coming from her back, below her left shoulder. She was breathing, but then the breathing changed to coughing. By the time the ambulance man arrived to take her to hospital, her breathing had stopped. It was two hours later, and I was still in my wet clothes. Sergeant McGonigal had come from the city police to question the witnesses to the murder. He had already talked to the officials, who had the best view of the pool, and now he was talking to me, Victoria Warshavsky. He knew me already, of course. I told him about my part in the events. Before leaving him, I asked what he had learned about the dead woman. Her name was Louise Carmody, he said. She was 24, and she worked for the Dearborn Bank. Nobody knew of any enemies. Alicia was waiting for me in the hall. She looked worried. Can we talk? she said after I put on some dry clothes. We went back together to my apartment, and I had a hot bath. When I joined her in the living room, she was watching television. No news yet, she said. Who was the dead girl? Louise Carmody, from Dearborn Bank. Did you know her? No, I didn't. Do the police know why she was shot? Not yet. What do you know about it? Nothing. Will he put her name on the news? Probably, if your family has been informed. Why is this important to you, Alicia? 
Oh, no special reason. She looked very anxious. I didn't believe her. She was hiding something. Alicia, do you know who did the shooting? At first you were in lane two. Then they changed the swimmer's positions, and nobody knew who was in which lane. I think they were shooting at you, not Louise. Who wants to kill you? No one, she shouted. She was silent for a minute. Then she said, Sorry, it was just such a shock. I'll try to control myself. Good. I'll get some supper. I came back with some food, but Alicia didn't want any. She was watching the local news, and her face was white. The swimming pool murder was the top story, and the name of the dead woman was given. After that, Alicia didn't say much. She asked if she could spend the night with me. She lived an hour's drive out of town. I left her in the sitting room and went to bed. I was still angry that she didn't want to talk to me. The telephone woke me at 2.30 a.m. A male voice asked for Alicia. I don't know who you are talking about, I said. If you don't want to wake her, give her this message. She was lucky yesterday. We want the money by 12 o'clock. Or she won't be so lucky a second time. I heard the sound of the telephone being put down. Then I heard another similar sound, the telephone in my living room. I got there just as the apartment door was shutting. Alicia had heard the message, and now she was running away. I could hear her feet on the stairs. I woke up at eight with a bad cold, the result of sitting around in wet clothes and I was anxious about Alicia. She had clearly borrowed a very large sum of money from someone if he was ready to kill her. But who? I telephoned her office. The secretary said she was sick and was staying at home. I tried her home telephone. No answer. Alicia had one brother, Tom, who worked for an insurance company. When I spoke to him, he said he hadn't heard from Alicia for weeks. Their father in Florida hadn't heard from her either. In Chicago, there are some big criminal groups. Two years before, I had given some help to Don Pasquale, the leader of one of them. Now, he might be able to help me. I telephoned Ernesto, who works for him. Did you hear about the murder of Louise Carmody at the university swimming pool last night? She was probably shot by mistake. They wanted to kill Alicia Dauphin, who is an old friend of mine. She has borrowed a lot of money from someone. I thought you might know something about it, Ernesto. I don't know her name, Warshawski. I'll ask around and let you know. I couldn't think where Alicia was hiding. Perhaps she was in her own house, but not answering the telephone? I decided to go and have a look. Her house in Warrenville is near the local school. I left my car outside the school and walked to the house, past a field where some boys were playing football. Her car was in the garage, but I couldn't see any sign of life in the house. A cat came out of the trees towards me. It seemed to be hungry. I went round to the back, and there I found that someone had broken in through the kitchen window. Ah, uh, why hadn't I brought my gun with me? My cold had affected my brain. Feeling nervous, I climbed through the window, and the cat followed me. In the kitchen and the living room, everything was tidy. And in Alicia's study, her computers and electronic equipment were all in place. Clearly, the person who broke in had not come to steal things. Had he come to attack Alicia? I went upstairs, followed by the cat. There was no one in any of the rooms. 
As I began to go down the stairs again, I heard a strange sound. Where was it coming from? I realized it was above me. In the ceiling there was a square hole with a wooden cover leading to the space under the roof. Someone was pushing back the cover. An arm came down, and the arm was holding a gun. I ran down the stairs two at a time. A heavy noise. Someone jumping down to the floor. The sound of the gun being fired and a pain in my left shoulder. I fell the last few steps to the bottom, but managed to stand up and get to the door. Then I heard the angry cry of the cat, the shout of a man, and a loud crash that sounded like someone falling downstairs. As I opened the door, the cat rushed past me. She had saved my life. I walked with difficulty to the road where the boys playing football saw me and came to help. The man with the gun escaped, but they got me to a hospital. There, a young doctor took the bullet out of my shoulder. My thick winter coat had saved me from serious damage. They put me to bed, and I was happy to stay there. When I woke, there was a man in a suit sitting beside the bed. Miss Warshavsky? I'm Peter Carlton, FBI. He showed me his card. I know you're not feeling well, but I must talk to you about Alicia Dauphin. Where is she? We don't know. She went home with you after the swimming competition yesterday. Is that correct? So, the FBI were following her? Why are you interested in her? He didn't want to tell me. He only wanted to know exactly what Alicia had said to me. Finally, I said, Mr. Carlton, you tell me why you are interested in Alicia, and I'll tell you if I know anything connected with that interest. He spoke slowly. We believe she has been selling Defense Department secrets to the Chinese. No, I said. She wouldn't do that. Some of her designs for plane parts are missing. She's missing, and a Chinese businessman is missing. The designs may be in her home. They could be on a computer disk. She does all her work on computer. He told me they had looked through all her computer material at home and at work, and had found nothing. I told him everything Alicia had said. And I told him about the attack on me. Perhaps the man hiding in her house had stolen the discs. He didn't believe me. I was getting tired and asked him to leave. Next morning, both my cold and my shoulder were much better. The doctors agreed that I could leave hospital. When I got home, I telephoned Ernesto about Alicia. He told me she had borrowed $750,000 from Art Smolensk. Art Smolensk, the king of gambling. I didn't think Alicia was a gambler, but I didn't know her well these days. The telephone rang. It was Alicia, talking against a background of noise. I saw the news. Thank God you're safe, Vic. Don't worry about me. I'm all right. She put the telephone down before I could ask her anything. Where was she? I thought about the noises in the background. They seemed familiar. From a long time ago. Suddenly I remembered. It was the sports hall of our old high school. And the swimming teacher, Miss Finley, was a close friend of Alicia's. The school is in a poor part of South Chicago. There was a guard at the entrance. I showed her my detective's card and said I needed to see the girl's swimming teacher. She let me in and I found my way to the sports hall where a lot of girls in orange shirts were doing exercises. Then I walked through the changing rooms to the swimming pool. 
when I was at school, we called it the old swimming hole. A few students, boys and girls, were swimming up and down. Alicia was sitting on a chair by the wall, looking at the floor. I joined her. Vic? She looked frightened. Are you alone? Yes, I'm alone. What are you doing here? I'm helping Miss Finley with the swimming. She teaches Spanish, too, and she's very busy. Is something wrong, Vic? You are in deep trouble. Smolensk is looking for you, and so is the FBI. You can't hide here forever. The FBI? She really seemed shocked. What do they want? Your designs? They are missing, and the FBI think you sold them to the Chinese. I took the discs home on Saturday evening. Oh my God! I must get out of here before someone finds me. Where can you go? The FBI and Smolensk are watching all your friends and relations. Tom, too? She was starting to cry. Especially Tom. Alicia, tell me everything. I need to know. I've already been shot once. She told me. Tom was the gambler. He had lost everything he owned, but he still couldn't stop. Two weeks ago he had gone to his sister for help. I have to help him. You see, our mother died when I was thirteen and he was six. I looked after him and got him out of trouble. I still do. But how does Malensk have your name? Is that the man Tom borrowed money from? Tom uses my name sometimes. And the designs? Tom came to dinner on Saturday, and he went into the study. I guess he took the discs I had been using, thinking they might be valuable. He knows that my company does a lot of work for the government. It was a gamble, and a gamble that he could sell them before I found out. Alicia, you can't be responsible for Tom forever. I think we should call the FBI. At this point, Miss Finley came in. She was surprised to see me. Have you come to help Alicia? she said. I found she knew most of the story. She thought it would be wrong for Alicia to tell the FBI about her own brother. They went off together. After some time, I went to look for them and found Alicia alone in an office. Miss Finley is teaching a Spanish class, she said. Listen, the important thing is to get those discs back. I called Tom, and he agreed to bring them here. I told him I would help him with the money. She didn't understand. She didn't see that if the Chinese businessman had left the country, he would have the discs with him. Tom had sold her discs. He no longer had the material. Where is he meeting you? At the pool? Now, please, you go to Miss Finley's class and I'll meet him at the pool. She agreed in the end, but she refused to let me call the FBI. I must talk to Tom first. It may all be a mistake. I sent the students out of the pool area and put a notice on the door saying it was closed. I turned out the lights and sat down in a dark corner, my gun in my hand. At last, Tom came in through the boys' changing room. Ellie? Ellie! he called. A minute later, another man joined him. He looked like one of Smolensk's group. He spoke softly to Tom. Then they went to look in the girls' changing room. When they returned, I had moved towards the doors to the main part of the school. Tom, I called. It's the I. Warshavsky. I know the whole story. Give me the discs. His friend moved his arm. I shot at him and jumped into the water. 
his bullet hit the place where I had been standing. Another bullet hit the water by my head. I went under the water again. As I came up, I heard Alicia's voice. Tom, why are you shooting at Vic? Stop it! There were some more shots, but not at me. I got to the side of the pool and climbed out. Alicia lay on the floor. Tom stood there silently, while his friend pushed more bullets into his gun. I ran to him, caught his arm, and stepped as hard as I could on his foot. But Tom... Tom was taking the gun from him. Tom was going to shoot me. Drop that gun, Tom Dauphin! It was Miss Finley, who taught difficult boys in a rough school. Tom dropped the gun. Alicia lived long enough to talk to the FBI. Tom told his story to the police. He had wanted Smolensk to kill his sister before she said anything about him. Then the world would think she had sold her country's secrets. The FBI arrived five minutes after the shooting stopped. They had been watching Tom, but not closely enough. They were angry that Alicia had been killed while they were on the case. So they said her death was my fault. I hadn't told them where Alicia was. I spent several days in prison. It seemed like a suitable punishment, just not long enough.